ACCV, we're so glad that you're with us. Would you stand to your feet as we get ready to worship? Let me see you put your hands together. Come on. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. tried with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Let's sing this out. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friends a burden and bitterness you can't just keep them moving yeah no you ain't welcome here now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how Save my soul. This wayward son has found his way back. my hands lifted 
it high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Jesus, there's nothing impossible When all I see are the ashes You see the beauty oh, When all I see is a cross You see the empty tomb Oh, as you do so Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty Fortress, you go before. to sing together. It is so good to be together. Are you guys happy to be here or what? Same. We're going to continue to sing. We're going to continue to worship. And as we do, we want to teach you all a new song. It's called Glory to the One. And this is a song that a group of us from CCV wrote with some of our new friends in Uganda at Watoto Church last year in May. We had a worship camp. It was a week long. And all week long, we were writing songs. We were teaching music. And then at the very end of the week, all the songwriters came together and this song is what came out. And the real inspiration from this song was the book of Colossians in chapter one, the back half that starts in uh, verse 15, talks about the supremacy of Christ, that Christ reigns supreme. He, Christ Jesus, is the visible image of the invisible God, that he holds all things together that he has reconciled and redeemed all of creation to himself. He was there in the beginning and he reigns supreme now, amen. So this song, it really is a response of all the things that God has done and who he is. And it's just saying, glory to the one who holds it all. And then there's this declaration part in the song that says, all honor, all glory and power belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone. Can we agree on that? Amen. So we want to teach you guys this song. It's called Glory to the One. And whenever you get it, we would love for you to sing along with us. It goes like this. Glory to the one who holds it all. Glory to the one who saved my soul. To the one who I adore. Praise the Lord. Glory to the one who reigns on high. Glory to the God who 
for that he's the God he's the God who moves the mountains reconciles the broken-hearted and in him we found redemption redemption so we sing glory to the one all together Glory to the one who holds it all. Glory to the one who saved my soul. To the one who I adore. Praise the Lord. Glory. Glory to the one who reigns on high. Glory to the God who saved my life. To the one who I adore. generations so what else can we do but worship thank you Jesus
CCV, can we get an amen? Woo! Man, thank you for worshiping with us today. You can take a seat. My name is Stephen Ein, and I'm a pastor on staff here. And listening to that song, listening to the stories that we've heard through this series so far, I'll be honest, it's had me reflect on my own testimony, on my own story. And it took me back to when I was 15. I was at a camp, and I remember Rob, a guy, got speaking about his story, his life, and it was wild. I mean, his dad was murdered when he was younger. He had to be the man of the house at a young age, and they were out on the street. And when they had nowhere else to turn, a family, a Christian family, brought them in. And it was in that moment that he experienced Jesus for the first time. His life turned around. He became a preacher of the gospel. And I remember sitting there, hearing his story, thinking, I want to do that one day. But I thought, my story is just boring compared to his. I mean, I'm thinking about all the things in his life. I've mean, got normal family, Christian parents, pretty, pretty standard experience. Someone who grew up in church. Nothing exciting to share. And I remember I told that to Rob, and he looked at me, and it got really serious really quick. He said, Stephen, you think, you think your parents being together and, and loving you and your brother consistently and faithfully, you think that's boring? You think a church that was faithful to their commitments and helped raise you up, you think that's boring? And it hit me because he said, your story is a story of God's faithfulness. And, and you need to celebrate that. And also, don't waste it. I remember thinking, I didn't, I didn't know I was going to be on this stage that day. I didn't know I was going to even be in full-time ministry. But I knew that I didn't want to waste that blessing that God had given me of a firm foundation. But it started with doubt. And if I had to guess, there's a lot of people maybe for different reasons, but that you doubt your story. You doubt that God can use your life experiences. God does not doubt it. God will absolutely use your story. It's not boring. It's not too crazy. It's not too wild. God sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. And we're about to take those elements to represent that moment on the cross when he died for us, that ultimate story, the story of mankind where God sacrificed himself for us. But that story is woven in each of our stories. And each of us have a story to share that is uniquely different and uniquely reveals a different part of God. And your story might share something about God that I don't have in my story. And my story might have something that yours doesn't. But together, we reveal God to this world. Together, we bring heaven on earth. And, and so I just want you to take some time while you take those elements. Thank God for his sacrifice and then begin to think about your story and how his story are woven together. Because you might doubt your story, but God doesn't. And he's ready to use it to change lives. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this moment that we get to share. We know that we have our doubts. We know the enemy speaks those doubts into our heart, but that you believe in us and you believe that the experiences of our lives were not by mistake, but that you're gonna use them for the greater good to build your kingdom. And God, we know you want us to be a part of your story. And God, you know our church here at CCV, we need everyone's story to take this valley for Jesus Christ. Pray this all in your son's name. Amen.
You know, it's, uh, it's right here, right now, in this moment that God is moving in our midst. And I think we need to celebrate all that God's doing in our church uh, because last weekend, 182 people gave their lives to Jesus and were baptized. And that's worth, that's worth celebrating. And as, as we start today, what I want to pray is no matter what you walked in with today, that God would allow you to walk out focusing, doing what we sing in that song, to focus, focus all of our attention on what matters most, Jesus. Can we pray? Father, thank you for how you're moving. I pray for the person right now that wonders if you could change their life. I pray for the mom who feels discouraged, for the teenager who has thoughts that that even scare them. I pray for, for everyone in our church that you would Help us focus on you in this moment and watch you change our life like you always do. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, uh, you know, it was earlier this week on Wednesday that I got a group of our leaders together, and we do this every year at the beginning of the year. We hike to the top of a mountain here in the valley. We looked over the valley, and we just began to pray for our city. We began to pray for 2023, and we feel like it's the most important thing we do all year long, and 
I just need you to know, I walked away from this prayer time and I am crazy expectant for all that God is going to do in our church in 2023. And every year, I pick one word that's gonna direct our staff for the year. And I wanna tell you what that one word is, but to help explain this word, I want to try to explain the difference between McDonald's and In-N-Out, okay? Now, when it comes to their burgers, all right, a burger between McDonald's and In-N-Out. Now, is there anyone here that would choose a McDonald's hamburger over an In-N-Out hamburger? Is anybody out there that would do that? If, if there is, I'm praying for your soul in 2023, okay? Now, truth be told, all right, and I saw a couple hands go up, and that's kind of what's wrong with our world today, all right? Um, you know... Truth be told, it's not like our family doesn't ever go to McDonald's, all right? I've, I've had a McDonald's burger and, yeah, I had one, right? You have too. But, this proves that God is good, all right, right here. Let, let's close in prayer. Father, I just want to... <laughs> Some of you are like, I know where I'm going after church, right? I mean, our family, truth be told, most times when we have to go out to eat and it's gonna be fast, we choose In-N-Out probably more than any other place to eat. We love In-N-Out. But what is the difference between their burgers? What's the difference? What do, you, what do you think it is? Now, here's what's interesting to me. You can throw out a lot of things. What's interesting to me is both of these companies produce hamburgers. Both of them have amazing leaders that, that lead both the companies, and both of them have the resources to do anything they want with incredible excellence. And yet, one of them is known for 99.9% for .9 of people as very average, and one of them has lines out the door. You ever waited in an uh, in and out line, in the drive through line? It's crazy. What is the difference? I think it's one word. At a high level, here's what I think the difference is. It's focus. One of these companies is incredibly focused, and one of them is scattered in a million different directions. Let me just show you a menu. You ever seen an in and out menu? <laughs> That's called focus. That's called putting all of your energy all of your influence into a few things, especially the burger, to make it unbelievable. You ever seen a McDonald's menu? Take a look at this. You ever seen a McDonald's menu? It's all over the place. I mean, it's a hundred different directions and almost everything is average except I'll give them the fries, okay? I'll give them the fries. It's good. But one is focused, one is scattered in a hundred different directions. The word that I chose for our staff in 2023 is the word focus. When we talk about fast food, that's one thing. It doesn't really matter. But the same principle applies to our life, your life and mine. I don't know anybody that wants to be uh, average. I don't know anybody that says, you know what my goal is? To get to the end of this year and, and it to be, for everyone to say like, they're mediocre. If you wanna do something great in this world, for God to use your life, I believe it requires focus. And one of the things I've been talking to our team about in our church is I want us as a church to focus on the right things because you can get drawn in so many different directions that you find that at the end of the day, you're simply average. In fact, the old CEO of Intel, Andy Grove, he's a genius, he said this at one point. He said, if you focus on everything, you focus on what? Nothing. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for our church. I want to have focus. And so the question as we go into 2023 is, do you have focus in your life? Where are you focused? Are you putting your energy and your influence behind what matters most? Or are you drifting through life scattered in so many different directions that everything in your life just feels mediocre, it feels average? I don't want that for you. And God doesn't want that for you. And so this year, and today specifically, I'm gonna challenge all of us to focus on one thing 
that should be our main thing. And that's this, that we would say this, I'll focus on using my influence to point people to Jesus. Did you know at the end of your life, there is only one thing you will have focused on that you can take with you to heaven? It's people that you help point to Jesus. That is the only thing you get to take with you. There are no U-Hauls that go behind hearses. Zero. You, you don't get to take anything with you except for the people you influence for Jesus. And yet for some of us, we just be honest, that's the last place we put our focus. And some of us, the problem would be this. We would say, well, I'm not putting my influence there because I don't really have any influence. I'm not an influencer, Ashley. And I want you to hear today, and I hope you walk away feeling this. You have more influence than you could ever imagine. Every single one of us is an influencer. I know not everyone's a, a, a Jesus follower here today, but listen to what Jesus said about you if you are a Jesus follower and Jesus is living inside of you. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter five, verse 13. He said what? He said, you are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Salt does three things primarily, right? It, it purifies, it preserves, and it makes things taste better. You were designed to be salty. Not that kind of salty, okay? You should designed to make things better. The very next verse, Jesus says, you weren't designed to just be salt. You are the light of the world. If you walk into a dark room and you turn on the lights, everyone notices. My wife and I have a little running joke. Um, what happens in our household is um, I am up almost every morning before my wife. Okay, I'm, I'm up. I, I'm an early riser. I like to get the day going. And so I am so careful turning on the lights not to wake her up. Okay, I'm like, I'm like a little mice. I'm like a little mouse walking around and I'm like, you know, sleeping beauty's over here. Let's be careful. Let's close the closet door. Then I'll turn the light on. Close the bathroom door. Then I'll turn. I don't want to wake her up because I love her. Now her on the other hand, okay, when she wakes up before me, like the few times she wakes up before me, I swear, it's like she turned on every light in the house. I'm like, what? Is, any other guys relate with this? Any other guys out there? I see elbows flying on our campuses, right? Listen, you were designed to turn on every light, to be a light in every room you walk into, unless your husband's sleeping, okay? Let's just get that straight. But you are designed to be an influencer. You are an influencer. And the reason some of us don't feel that is because our world has hijacked the term influencer. And I think we need to keep it back, take it back. I know it's been hijacked, because this week, and you can try this, I went to Google, I typed in the word influencer into Google, I went 20 pages deep in Google search before I gave up. Every article on an influencer defines influencer by how many followers you have on social media. That's crazy. Think about your life. When you think about your life, who's influenced your life more than anyone else? Like, who, who's transformed your life? Anybody out there, and if this is you, that's great, but anyone out there would say this, the person who changed my life was someone I didn't really know on social media that had thousands or a million followers. Anybody out there? Like, how is that how we define influencer today? You know, you know who an influencer is today? A teacher, a parent, a coach, Someone who came alongside you in a, a real desperate time of need. Someone who led a small group or a Bible study that you were a part of and came alongside you and, and really helped you in a time of need. That's who an influencer is. How on earth have we started to define influencer by your popularity or how many followers you have on social media or a platform? I think we should redefine influencer and it should start in our church. Listen. You don't need, hear this, let this sink into your heart today. You don't need thousands of followers to have influence. You just need to have a heart for one person that God's put in your path today. You need to feel that. You need to redefine it. Why? Because true influence 
always starts with people over platform. It always starts with people over platform. That's true influence. In other words, the size of your platform doesn't determine the depth of your influence. What does? The size of your heart determines that. Now, some of you right now, you actually have a really large platform. There's some of you that have you know, thousands of followers and maybe a million followers on social media. Some of you have a lot of people that work for you. Some of you just have a very uh, influential role in, in whatever you're doing in life, and I praise God for that. But I want you to hear this. Just because you have a platform doesn't mean you have true influence. If you're using that influence for you not to impact people for eternity. I know people that have thousands of followers that are changing no one. I know people that have zero followers on social media and they are changing a generation like you couldn't even imagine. And I hesitate to tell this part of the story, but it's, I'm just so close to it, I know it. One of those people in my life is that woman that turns on the lights when she wakes up really early in my house, my wife, Jamie. My wife has never had social media. She has, which means what? She has zero followers and zero platform the way the world defines it today. And yet, she is lighting up more people's life than I know of almost anyone else I know. And today, with zero followers, I could show you an army of people on this stage, I could bring on this stage that would say that she's changed their life. I could bring up moms that she's invested in. I could bring up junior hires that say that they found Jesus because of her. I could bring up you know, so many friends that she's impacted. I could bring up all of our kids. Why? You don't need thousands of followers to have influence. You just need to have a heart for the one person God's placed in your path today. You are an influencer and God's called you to be an influencer. And today, I wanna open up scripture and I wanna walk you through the story of probably the most unlikely influencer in all of scripture. The story comes from John chapter four, if you wanna turn there. And what's going on in John chapter four is Jesus is going to take a trip. He's been ministering in Judea, in, in the area of Jerusalem, that's in southern Israel, and he's gonna go north up to Galilee, which is in northern Israel. Israel's actually a fairly small place, but Judea's in the south, Galilee's in the north, and to get from Judea to Galilee, you have to travel in the middle part of Israel through a place called Samaria. And in Jesus' day, you just have to understand this, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And if you've ever read scripture, you wonder why they hated them so much. Let me explain it to you. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God chose a people for himself to reveal himself through the nation of Israel, and there were 12 tribes. 10 of those tribes at one point divided and broke off and went north, and those 10 tribes began to practice evil, and, and they, they were doing a lot of pagan things, and they really strayed from God, and part of what they did is they started intermarrying with a lot of the pagan people of that day. And for a Jew, you just have to understand, for a Jew not to marry another Jew, but to intermingle with someone else, that was worse than marrying your sister. I mean, this is why they hated Samaritans, this mixed breed so bad, and they looked at them as worse than dogs. In fact, a, a Samaritan wasn't even allowed to testify in a Jewish court because they didn't even look at them as human. And yet Jesus, traveling through Samaria, is going to, to surprise everyone because that's just what Jesus does. And he not only interacts with a Samaritan woman, which would have been unheard of, but he shows her compassion and dignity, and he releases her to be one of the greatest influencers in all of Scripture. Let's pick up the story in John chapter four, verse six. It says, Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was around noon. Now remember, it's around noon time. Remember that. But can we just pause and anybody else encourage that Jesus got worn out too? Like Jesus can relate with you. Jesus was worn out, so he sits down at this well in the middle of Samaria and a Samaritan woman approaches and Jesus asks her for a drink. Watch her response, verse nine. The Samaritan woman, taken back, asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to a Samaritan. And Jesus' response is interesting. He says this to her. He says, if you knew who was talking to you, 
you'd be asking me for a drink of living water. Now she's a little spicy, she says back, she says, living water? You don't even have a bucket, bro. You can't get any water in this well. And Jesus says this, he says, it's not the kind of water I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you can go thirsty getting that kind of water you came here to get. I'm talking about a kind of water where you would never feel empty or thirsty again. Now the text doesn't say this, but in my mind, I just wonder if she teared up in that moment. Because if there was anyone in all of Samaria that would have felt empty inside, it was this woman. And we know the depth of her emptiness because she showed up at the well at noon. It's a clue for us. If you understood that culture, no one, no one was coming to a well at noon in the afternoon. Israel has a climate that is somewhat similar to Phoenix. In in the afternoons, it can get up to 100 and 110 degrees in temperature. So every single day when women went to go get their water, all of them went in the morning or after the sun went down. Why would this woman have to come at noon? Because her behavior was such that she was so rejected and shunned by that society, it's the only time she could come. And she interacts with Jesus, and Jesus tells her about this living water, and I think with tears in her eyes, she says, I want that living water. And listen to Jesus' response. He says next in verse 16, he said, well, go call your husband first and have him come back. And she says, well, I have no husband, she said. But that wasn't really true, was it? Kind of a half-truth. Jesus tells her, he says, that's put nicely, I have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't your husband. Now, in our day and age, if you had been married five times and divorced, and then you were living with someone else, I mean, that might be your story, and this is no shame, but that might raise some eyebrows with even people in our day and age. But you have to understand, in Jesus' day, for a woman to be divorced five times and then be living with someone else, she would have been rejected beyond your imagination. She would have no platform, no influence, no followers. And yet Jesus dignifies her, interacts with her, and shares who he is and that he wants her to have a better life than she's living And he's the answer. And she realizes it. She's cut to the heart. She says, I want that living water. And in in a rush, she leaves her pot and she rushes off to the town. Remember, a woman that has no influence in her town at all says, verse 29, back in the village, she just began to tell people, you gotta come and see. Come and see. Like you gotta come and see the man who knew all the things I ever did. You guys know me. You know all the bad things I've done. He told me everything. In fact, he told me things I hadn't told anyone. He knows me inside and out. Is that not powerful? Jesus knows everything you've ever done. She just, remember our Bridges series? She's not overcomplicated. She just says, you gotta come and see. And then she says this, could he be the Messiah? Now here's what you'd think would happen. A woman like that, she's got no influence. She's got nobody who wants to follow her. You think they do this. Get out of my face, messed up woman. You're jacked up. I'm not listening to you. The exact opposite happens. Watch this. Verse 30, they went out to see for themselves. We'll find out later why, I think. But watch the power in verse 39. Many, many, many in her city of the Samaritans from that village committed themselves to Jesus, him, because of the woman's witness He knew all the things I did. He knows me inside and out. This is incredible to me. The most unlikely woman that has no influence influences her entire town and city for Jesus and creates a revival. In fact, if you read through all the gospels, this is arguably the most effective witness for Jesus out of anyone in the gospels. But her story is not an isolated story. God has been taking people that the world says has no influence and been using them to transform the world for Jesus. And I think this woman's story, if you wanna utilize and focus your influence in 2023 to make a difference for Jesus, 
This woman's story gives us three principles I wanna share with you today that will allow you to focus your influence on pointing people to Jesus as well. If you're taking notes, here's number one. Influence doesn't start with a platform, it starts with the heart for people. I just wanna say it again until it gets drilled in your head. You don't have to have a platform. This woman had no platform, and yet she transformed people, why? Because she just had a heart for people. She wanted to go back, and she just began to share her story, even the messy parts of her story. She was a mess, and that became her message. I wonder how many of you have, have written down your story of how God's moved in your life. You know, I'll, I'll ask that to people sometimes, and, and they'll say, I've never written down my story. And I just want to encourage everyone here today, you should write down your story. It will help you be prepared to share your story. In our CCV mobile app, we have a little link that says share my story and it just walks you through how to do it in a really quick and concise way. It doesn't have to be long, but I think you should write down your story and be prepared because this woman just shared her story and it became a revival. The second thing I think we see from her story is you don't have to have your life all together to influence people for Jesus. Someone needs to hear that today. You don't have to have your life together, all together to influence people for Jesus. You know what this woman didn't do? She didn't hear who Jesus is, wanna accept Jesus and go, hey, before I share my faith, before I start impacting people, I'm gonna go back and clean my whole entire life up, okay? I gotta make this thing right with this guy, I gotta, I gotta become clean, I gotta read through the Bible at least one time, right? So I can answer everyone's questions, theological questions they might have. I gotta, I gotta grow up in my faith before God can use my faith. And I'm just telling you, her story tells us that is absolutely wrong. And yet some of us, we're not sharing our faith because you know how, you know what we feel like? We feel a little bit like a sixth grader in our faith. What are, what, what's a sixth grader like? Sixth grader is awkward, smelly. You know, has a lot of stuff to still figure out. I mean, God can't use a sixth grader to impact people for Jesus, can he? Maybe that's exactly who God wants to use. It was, uh, it was fifth grade, and uh, me and a few of my friends, it was cool. We got invited to go to a Bible study at a different school in the mornings. We saw the impact that it was having on that school, and then honestly, like a few months in, we're sitting there, me and my friends, and we're like, hey, what if we did this at our school? I, we were all just like a little nervous at first, you know, like starting something big, but we're like, all right, well, what's the first step? We're like, okay, we need a host classroom. So about seven years ago, I was teaching sixth grade math and I had six boys in my class um, come up and ask if they could use my classroom for a weekly Bible study. And I would just sit at my desk, let them do their thing. And I mean, I'm listening kind of, and these boys just to the core of themselves, every ounce of their body was their faith. And like, for me, that was like, oh my gosh, these are sixth grade boys. That's not the norm. And listening to these boys just talk about it, I was like, oh my gosh, like that's, I want that. Like, I want that in my life. Sometimes she like went out and like did like recess duty or whatever, so she wouldn't be in there. But then there was like one morning and she actually like joined in on our conversation. And I remember we had a discussion question um, and we all went around the table answering it. And then uh, Miss Phillips jumped in and answered it for herself. And we're like, hey, that was really cool. And then we, you know, had a little discussion with her. I was lost um, when these boys came into my life. I was not in a good place. I was depressed. I was lonely. I was searching for these boys to just, their faith to influence and just to show me that amazingness of God. I guess I didn't even know that it was missing. And so then to see those boys, I saw what I was missing out on. 
the day was so cool. I remember one moment, the four of us that started it, she pulled us out of our classrooms during the day and she was like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that you guys have inspired me and impacted my life that like your faith that you've shown in this classroom has really moved me and influenced me um, that I actually decided to like go all in with Jesus and get baptized at my church. And just hearing her say those words shocked all of us. And we were like, whoa, like God is so good. Like we would have never imagined something like that would happen. And we were all very joyful and we were just super happy for her. Who would have thought four boys in a sixth grade classroom could change an adult's life? I can just imagine like how lost I would have been. Now, I mean, you can feel lost for a moment, <laughs> but you also know who's right next to you going through it. I still talk to some of them or even talk to their parents. And I, anytime they talk about him, I, I tell them, oh my gosh, I tell them I love them and just, they changed my life. So looking back, I learned about the power of influence. And honestly, at the time, like me and my buddy's goal, like our main goal wasn't to, you know, influence the teachers and the students. Like we just wanted to grow a Bible study and share the love of Jesus. But the biggest thing at that time is we just remained faithful and we were just obedient. When we felt a calling on our heart, we were ready to act. And I mean, we were just like, we were just middle schoolers. Like we didn't have a whole lot of uh, influence or social status, you know. We definitely weren't perfect in any means. You know, we'd always forget to do the laundry, or do the dishes at home, right? Um, but we were faithful and we were obedient. And seeing what God did with that is something that he can do in everyone's life, right? When you feel a calling on your heart and you're faithful and obedient and you walk in his steps, just watch and see the amazing things that God's gonna do in your life because it's extremely powerful. Incredible. <clears throat> My favorite line from that story is when Lindsay says, who would have thought four sixth grade boys could win a teacher to Jesus? Here's the thing, I know personally several of those boys. Can I tell you something? They did smell. They're sixth graders, I promise you. They were awkward, they were weird at times. And if God can use a sixth grader to win a teacher to Jesus, you don't think God can use you to influence the people around you? Like, we have influence. The problem is, some of us, we're not using our influence, you know why? because we're so afraid of being viewed as a fraud. I want you to hear something today. All of us, to some extent, are a fraud, because none of us are perfect. In fact, all of us have a little sixth grader in us, don't we? My wife likes to tell me I do on occasion. You know who the biggest fraud is, in my opinion? Christians that try to act like they have their life all together, squeaky clean. In fact, I think those people have turned more people away from Jesus than anyone that has a little mess in their life ever has. Those people that walk around shining their halo all the time. That's not the kind of church that I wanna pastor. I wanna pastor a church where people are real and authentic. You don't need to walk around oversharing. But why shouldn't you share what God has done in your life? And you don't have to be perfect. That's why when I preach, I like to be authentic and tell you, I don't have my life all figured out. I mean, if you got to follow me around for a few weeks, and you got to see sometimes how I talk to my wife, you got to see the impatience I have with my kids on occasion, you got to see just how selfish I am, I mean, I would be ashamed. But I'm not relying on me being perfect to be effective for Jesus. I'm relying on pointing people to the only perfect person, Jesus. That's what I want. And I just, I want someone here to just feel you don't have to have your life all perfect. You're not perfect to be effective and influence people for Jesus. In fact, the third thing we learn from this woman's story is the messiest parts of our story can magnify 
the message of Jesus. Almost more than anything else. Your mess, God wants to use as his message. But some of us hold back. We're not sharing. You know why I think this woman was so effective? Because she went back to that town with all of her mess, and people were like, if Jesus could get a hold of this woman, I got to check this guy out. In our church today, the most effective people in winning people to Jesus are those that have the messiest past. Telling you. Promise you. In fact, let me tell you a story from last weekend. If you were here last weekend and you missed it, you gotta go back and watch it, but we told the story of Danielle. Danielle was a heroin addict. She, she left her child and went and lived on the street. She was digging through the dumpster for food. And she stumbled upon CCV and she began coming to CCV and it began transforming her life and she got help and she went to rehab and God's transformed her life and she's doing so well right now. But when we asked Danielle, would you just tell your story? Do you know how hesitant she was? My story. God could use that mess? Yes. So she said yes. She told her story. She attends our Midtown campus. Last weekend, a family from our Midtown campus invited another family. And what they didn't know is the woman that came, she was getting ready to take her life that weekend. She sat through the service She heard Danielle's story, and she so related with her story because it had similar aspects to her story, what she struggled with, and she decided, I want what she has. I want Jesus. She walked out of the service. She walked out the doors of our campus, and you know who she immediately ran into? Danielle. She starts telling her her story. They're both bawling. Danielle walks her over. They begin talking. This woman gives her life to Jesus that weekend, and guess who baptized her last weekend? Danielle got in the water and baptized her. You're telling me God can't use your messy story? In fact, God uses the messy parts of your story as the most powerful parts of your story. And some of you are holding back. What you tell people is this. Yeah, I had a little bit of a a tough uh, background. That's, that's the extent of you, of you sharing. No, you need to share in the appropriate ways with people about the rape, about the abandonment, about what happened sexually and how you just got so far off base, about the addiction, about your eating disorder, about your anxiety. God will use that part of your story. In fact, I believe there's someone in your life that God wants to put in your life, that they'll find Jesus when you share that part of your story. Listen, 2023 needs to be the year where all of us focus our influence on pointing people to Jesus. How do we do that? We simply start sharing our story. We focus on who God's put in our path and what my prayer is that the end of 2023, all of us at CCV would have a story where, we, where someone would say this, I found Jesus because they helped use their influence to point me to Jesus. And listen, every one of you has influence beyond what you could ever imagine from the sixth grader to the 70 year old, to the single mom, to the CEO, to the ex addict, to the person who you look like you have your life all together. God wants to use all of us to influence people in 2023 to point them to Jesus. And remember, you don't need thousands of followers on social media to be an influencer. You just need to have a heart for the one person that God's gonna place in your path today, tomorrow, this week. Who will it be? I don't know. Coworker, a friend, a family member, someone down the street, a neighbor. God will do it. The only question is, will you focus your influence on impacting them for Jesus? You in? CCB, you all in? Let me, uh, let me, let me, let me pray for all of us. Father, I, I pray for the person here in the audience that they do need Jesus. 
they're that person that needs to be influenced. And I pray, I pray they'd realize they're not here by accident. Would you help them to take a next step, to reach out for help, to talk to one of our staff or pastors or volunteers? I pray for all of us that are followers of Jesus. Would this year be the year that we narrow our focus to not be so scattered about the things that don't matter, but to be focused on influencing people for Jesus? God, I want that. And I know so many of us do. So would you give us the inspiration and the courage and just the conviction to go make that happen this year? And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, next weekend, I'm gonna continue the series. I'm fired up about next weekend's message. Until then, it's time to go all in. Have a good weekend, CCV.